precious a possession, a family home. It can take a lifetime to pay off, and yet fire can destroy it and all your photos and family treasures within minutes. It would be a heartbreaking tragedy. One typical victim is Rose Johnson and her daughter Lauren. A gas leak has ignited, sending flames sweeping through their home. The tragedy could have been much worse. Quick work by firefighters averted what could have been a much worse disaster. Across Australia, there are more than a quarter of a million firefighters. Every day, they are asked to put their lives and limbs on the line to save us and our property. For the past six months, we've been following the work of one such dedicated team. Hello, I'm Mark McKay. I'm from Blacktown Fire Station. I'm the station officer on C Platoon. We have two fire trucks, so I've got a crew of five firefighters. And we kept pretty busy attending a variety of incidents, including fires and rescues. Have you got that message? Factory total involved. One exposure. G'day. My name's Eddie O'Hara. I'm the senior fiery at um, Blacktown Fire Station. We're a rescue station out of the western suburbs. When we get such a variety of work, it gets quite busy sometimes, but it's good. Tonight, they were lucky. We're very lucky. I'm Brent Giles. This is our media station area of Blacktown. During a major emergency, we can be called anywhere in the state. Should be the first set of lights. Hi, I'm Martin Crew. I've been in the New South Wales Fire Brigades for five and a half years. Concerned for two occupants. Don't want to spoil an ambulance at all. No, no, no. I've done It is the best job in the world, an adrenaline rush every day, and we get to play with toys like this. Good day. My name's Anthony Hatch. This is some of the sophisticated equipment the brigade's given us. It's called a hydraulic spreader. It's got the crushing capacity, as well as spreading capacity for opening car doors. Here's the option. We can um, remove it for you, but we've lifted the roof up. Like, we had a backup plan. Rescue 63. Hi, my name is Sandy Warner. I've been a flight attendant with Qantas for the last seven years. But for something totally different and challenging, I've decided to join the New South Wales Fire Brigade. <laughs> It's all right, still in. Big. Not bad at all, actually. Yeah, I'm just going to follow instructions. Hopefully at the end of my four months training, I'll be a fully qualified firefighter. Ed, the tragedies that consume these firefighters every day. Basically here we have the main danger. This wall is going to collapse, more than likely. This guy's got to be careful in here because this roof is um, very dangerous. This might come down. But it's not just fires they have to deal no, with. That's our land. Oh, really? Yeah. If you'd been in there, where would you have been sitting? We would have been cleared away, mate. Really? Yeah, yeah. And then there are the rescues. Stop, job, job. Washing out some burning hair dye. I'm having a shower! And mopping up after a lightning strike. Fighting an out of control bushfire. It's what we all fear tragedies that take lives and property. Tragedies that Mark and team have dedicated themselves to fight. Like the bushfires of threatened houses on the northern outskirts of Sydney. Every day, they're confronted with every type of fire and rescue conceivable, including the very worst inferno. fuel storage tank has exploded and the Blacktown crew are responding. It's pretty good actually going to do something this big because it's not something like this might only happen once or twice in your whole career. They've got ground monitors which are in operation, and there's an effort with the Ericsson Aircraft helicopter as well, which is going to drop some foam. You only sort of hear and see these things happen in the States. Yeah, that's it. And yeah. you sort of see one happening in Wollongong. Most of the jobs we do are just around town at the maximum five or ten minutes, but uh, this is an hour or so, so you need to sort of be fully aware. With, we're on the freeway, so all the vehicles around us are doing high speeds. You also get people tailgating you. I've been watching a couple of cars in my rear vision mirror. Someone pulls out in front of me, I'm going to have a car up the backside as well as worrying what's in front of me. You hear the guys that have been in the job for years 
talking about, you know, back in 1965, we went to a fire like this. Yeah. So, yeah, a bit apprehensive, wondering what it's going to lead to. Like, we're talking millions of litres of fuel. That's a lot oh, of fuel. We're very close now. We can see a lot of flame and smoke. We've just seen the Ericsson helicopter fly over here. We can see a number of monitor jet streams flying in there. Across so we're going to go and check it out, report to the incident commander and see what they want us to do. Get on a line of hose and stick some foam in it or Here it comes. stand by. We've got the air crane coming over the top of us right now. That's a pretty impressive uh, and sign. dropping foam directly onto the top of the tank. And the object of that is to try and put a foam blanket which is going to suppress the fire. And, uh, it's made a couple of passes already, but it remains to be seen how effective that's going to be. You can see that it's very accurate. But the attack by the air crane fails. More men were ordered to the fire front by Commissioner the Greg tank, Mullins. Uh, the lid has blown off, gone onto the foam and water installation and destroyed it. So there's no on-site foam. Um, Mark Mackay and the Blacktown team are ordered to the fire front. Take it easy. But the main priority is to make sure the fire doesn't spread. Uh, it may be the case that the ethanol burns for hours or, or perhaps even days. And as long as the fire is prevented from spreading, that'll be the, the main objective. Intense heat, 70 metres away, has melted the back of these plastic sections. The number plate covers are all melted as you go along each car. All the rear brake lights, the plastic assembly on the boot is all melted. It, it's something you don't realise unless you actually experience it, just how intense radiant heat from a fire can be. I'm just about to go up on top of this truck here. We're going to use the monitor on the roof to get more water onto the exposure we're protecting, reposition it, it's ineffective at the moment, and ensure that that tank doesn't uh, get impinged by the flames. What we're gonna do is reposition the monitor, the stream right into the very edge of the fire. Yeah, I'll just move around. Yeah, it's kind of clipping the edge of it now. It's not making much difference, is it? No, it's not doing anything, it's just evaporating in the fire. Yeah, it's too hot. It's better off just bringing it back around onto the tank, I think. Yeah. Just direct a little bit to the left, try and get the stream onto the side of the tank. I'll just drop it down a bit. Okay. It's actually hitting the side now reasonably yeah. well, as you can yeah. see. Yeah. yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's flaring up hoops now. Look at this. Yeah. Yeah. We've got to keep this one as cold as possible. If this one explodes, we've got a big problem here. If it's an explosion, we'll have another fire like that. If it ruptures, we'll actually have a running fuel fire. It could very well come out this way. We'll be going that way at a great rate of knots. The tank that's on fire now, originally it was this size. The heat has been that extreme that it's actually started melting the sides of the tank. The tank is actually folding inside itself. The, the temperature in there must be just incredible. After we set up the monitors, frontos, and protect the extremes for this fire, there's not a lot we can actually do after that. This is the best way to attack this fire. We understand that you were one of the first firefighters here. We we're actually based on the uh, steelwork site. There was a large explosion, which we oh. felt at the actual fire station. Oh, okay. We got the shockwave first. So you were something pretty serious? Yeah. What was your initial firefighting attack? We set up over here first. And uh, we had Warrawong unit over there supplying us water through the monitor yeah, straight, straight onto the tank behind us, trying to cool that down to stop that from exploding. So what did you see when you first turned up? The first thing you'd actually see was the actual lid off the tank sitting there, and it used to be sitting up on the top. Do you have any, any idea how much that weighs? No idea, but I know it's bloody heavy. Yeah. So why didn't you put the fire out when you first got here when you had the opportunity? To, and it's already too massive. <laughs> I wish we could. You can see the intense heat of this fire, the guys have got to actually hose down the side of their truck because it's, um, you peel the paint off. You can see by the other storage container, all the paint's blistered and falling off the whole thing. The radiant heat off this is just massive. You can actually see the side of the tank glowing red, it's that hot. You can look between the first two monitors there. It looks like a reflection, but it's actually glowing red hot. All these lines of hose are coming in, the pumps are energising the water, pressurising it, four other trucks pumping into us, and we're pumping out into the monitors. Look at this bottle line doing nothing. Yeah, that's our halo. What we're going to do is make sure that the monitors are hitting the side of the tank properly. The idea is to keep the tank cool so that it doesn't overheat and rupture. Guys are repositioning. Very important that we don't overrun the water supply, otherwise all the monitors will shut down. Well, it's time for us to finish up now. Despite our best efforts, we haven't been able to put the fire out, so <laughs> it looks like it's going to burn throughout the night. It's just amazing the amount of heat coming off this fire, and um, I'll never see anything like it again, I don't think. It's the kind of fire you read about and study when, you, when you're learning for your exams, but you don't get the opportunity to fight these kind of fires very often, so it's been really interesting. It's a truly defensive firefighting strategy, just to make sure it doesn't spread. We can't put it out, so we're just going to leave it, let it burn off. 
perhaps later on when it gets a bit smaller they'll be able to uh, put some foam on it or something, but at this stage it's just defensive. There wasn't much we could do in the way of attacking the fire. We seen when we first got here the Ericsson Scrycane was dumping foam, it didn't have much effect. They've just set up one of the aviation air tankers. They're actually going to just be on standby in case the tank ruptures. So we're in defensive mode, there's not much that can be done. Back at Blacktown, a new emergency is unfolding. Well, they've got a call to a house fire and apparently there have been numerous calls. The initial message from our rescue, which has arrived, is that there's a house fully involved, so it's totally alive. As we arrive, our first job is to make sure that nobody's in the house. Mark and the crew were the first firefighters to arrive. The house is totally ablaze. And it's urgent to check whether anyone's been trapped inside. I don't know if there's anyone inside, but when we get in, we'll head right. Yeah, we'll do a search on the right there. Can you open? Hello? We've got to wait for water. What we did was get the fire crew to the door, get the hose to the door so they can make entry to the house. Hatchy has a very special role. Uh, my job was to search the, the rooms that were on fire while the fire crew were putting the fire out. Martin's job is to extinguish the fire. We had to back off twice because it was uh, so hot. Even through all our turnout gear, it was still starting to cook us a little bit. We didn't know whether there was anyone reported trapped inside. No one knew. So that meant that we had to commit to a full search of the building. We worked through slowly. The ceiling came down in on us as well. You can't see anything in there, it's just full of smoke. And when you're spraying water around you, you're creating steam. And then all of a sudden, if something caves in on you, you've got to back out, assess it, and then get back in. Uh, I found across the road the lady who was living in the house and spoke to her. So, Martha, were you in the house when it got fire? And did you have kids in the house with you as well? Yes. And how many kids have you got? Five. Do you want to come inside? I went to go and grab some water to try and put it out. Yeah. But it wouldn't go out. How big was it at that stage? All around the walls, or it was getting bigger, so my mum said just leave it. Yep. Yeah. Watch yourself, the fire's in the roof, and the roof's been dropping down. It's too early at this stage to say what's happened. We know the family in here, they've all managed to get out of the house, so that's the first concern. We've got the fire contained, it's still very hot, and we'll be making sure that the fire doesn't spread any further. And uh, once it's put under control, then we'll be making sure that we determine the location of the start of the fire. Still hot, the So, did you have time to get any of your possessions or any of your things out? No, I was just woke up my children. Yeah. It was too hot to do a search in there. You can see the shape of the bed where it used to be. I understand one of the kids had a, a small burn. Yes, he was the one that was asleep. And so he's the been... The fire was burning up under that bed and they both got up and ran into me. Now, I'm not sure if there were any smoke detectors in this area out here. My sister couldn't breathe properly. Yeah. And my brother got burnt. Yeah, where'd he burn himself? Oh, on his leg. Yeah, they gone to hospital, have you? Yeah. Okay. Our fire investigator is going to come and have a look and see if we can figure out exactly where the fire started and, and what might have caused it, so that, that'll probably take some time. Any of the things that we can salvage, we'll do that, bring them out if we can. But it looks like the fire's swept through the whole house, as you saw. This is top. Oh, we have sleep. I know. Yeah, well, you, you did the right thing, got the kids out first and then had a time to put the fire out yourself. You couldn't, so you, you got out, so that, that's very important. The heat's gotten to it. It's probably burnt the backing, but it was a mirror. We might be able to get some alternative accommodation organised for you anyway. Just stay around for a little while, we'll, we'll see what we can organise, OK? Yeah. As you can see, we're still a mess. But... As fires go, there's nothing good about them, but these are the best sort of house fires you can hope for. Not too hard to extinguish, everyone's safe, no one inside, which isn't too bad. For the past 16 weeks now, Sandy Warner and 80 other recruits have undergone an exhausting and gruelling training program, learning to rescue injured colleagues, mastering the art of directing high-pressure hoses. Yeah, the elevation's about right for that now. Yeah. It's been a hard-fought personal challenge for each of them, culminating in graduation night. A chance to set cars and buildings alight and show off some newly acquired skills. as they're sworn in as Australia's newest firefighters. It feels amazing. I'm really proud of myself. It's been very hard at 
time, but um, I just took one day at a time and got through. It's great. Her family and the state's fire commissioner, Greg Mullins, are delighted. So you're off to 63? Yes, yes. Oh, great. Well, busy station, so you'll learn a lot there. Next day, Sandy's on her way to Blacktown. I'm just feeling um, really nervous. I just don't know what to expect. Her first day on the job as a fully qualified firefighter. Are you a firefighter? Yes, I'm Sandy Warner. Mark McGuire, I'm the station officer here at C platoon. Great, Come and nice meet, to meet you. Meet the troops. Yep. Hey, Martin. Hi, Martin. Martin. Sandy, Martin. nice to meet you. And we have Brent. Good day. Hey, Brent. Nice to meet you. And this is Eddie. Hi, Sandy. Eddie. How are you? Good day. This is Anthony. Good day. How are you? How are you? This is the watch room in here. This is the nerve centre of the station. And if you have a tour in here, we come out of the last five You know, people are really depending on you now. And you're just scared that you're going to make a mistake and you'll do something wrong because the small mistake might mean something big. You just don't want to look incompetent. Yeah. There's the rooms where we sleep if we have a moment spare. Is the bedroom oh, to sleep usually, in? Or a bit of a pecking order to be on who oh, snores okay. the loudest and who's the most recent arrival at the station. Yeah. You'll find a spot for your gear and so when you're turning out in the middle of the night, you know where to find it. It's always there. Okay. The station Through tour here, also includes a visit to the unisex change rooms. Their own locker. Where Sandy learns she's going to need a broad mind for this job. <laughs> time you get out of the canyon, they're so exhausted you can't fight. Fire crews can never relax. One second they're sitting, talking, next the alarm sounds and they're on their feet off to their next emergency. The exciting thing about this job is the very first time you hear that siren go off and the lights flash and you think, oh, it's a job and you've got to run. What happens is we get a message from communications in the city. They send the uh, details through, through Intellix. We just rip it off. It gives us the details of where the emergency is, so we quickly look up where it is on the map, and then from there, we just jump onto the truck and get it close to the This is Sandy's first fire. The first opportunity to put into action those firefighting skills she's been honing these past four months. We're off to a car on fire. The actual incident's creating a lot of traffic. We're the emergency vehicle, but trying to get to the incident might be a bit of a problem because of the traffic that's built up. Sure enough, traffic has banked back from the car fire. Time for some creative driving. They're having to cross over the medium strip and start driving directly towards oncoming traffic. Thankfully, there are two oncoming lanes. Motorists sliding into the left lane to let the fire is through. Under lights and sirens, they've reached the blaze within four minutes of their call out, and the car is still well alive. Not much the owner's been able to do, except watch on as Sandy's asked to squirt water on the flames. Station officer Mark Mackay's there to give some seasoned advice. Just move in a bit closer, keep down low. That was really, you know, quite calm. It wasn't... I still had that little adrenaline rush, but I just did it, so it's good. It was a bit more um, harder than I thought. Like, you kept wetting the fire and it just kept flaring up again. So, yeah, I just had to keep going and going, thinking, when is this thing going to go out? With all that oil and petrol to fuel it, the flames are proving very stubborn. So you're the owner of this car? Yep. And the... how did it catch fire? Well, you come around this corner, right? And the bike fell over in the trail, you know. Oh, so, so you got this motorcycle yeah, on the trail. Yeah, you? yeah, behind us. Straight away we pulled over, and the next minute I think a car beeped as it went past. Yeah. Like, what are you beeping at? Are we in the way, you know. And I looked yeah. and there's just smoke bellowing out of the corner. Yeah, yeah. yeah, lifted up and flames just shot into yeah. his face. As for the car, well, that's clearly a write-off. Okay, Brent, do you want to get the bottom open? Oh, okay. One plus, it's given Sandy her first experience with a real emergency. Get some water on it to cool right down. Did you find it, thanks. Good to get your first fire out of the way. Yeah. It's good to get a car fire where there's no other complications, no one's in the car, no other things involved, so you yeah. can just concentrate on getting your fire out. Yeah. Well done. As the last of the flames are extinguished, a new drama is unfolding. Seems the traffic jam caused by the burning car has delayed one young woman. Her car is overheated and she's having a very bad hair day. I'm a hairdresser and instead of like doing our hair in the 
the salon, we do it. And then we just go home and wash it out. Well, I got caught in traffic and then I overheated my car and now it blowed up. <laughs> a nice temperature for you. Oh, yeah, it's hot. I wasn't expecting this much traffic. Yeah, my hair would have fell out. It's all right, it's still in. <laughs> it doesn't look like it's still too much. Have you been a hairdresser in a past life? No. <laughs> With several thousand litres of water on board, there'll be no shortage of rinsing water. Clearly a purse for both Sandy and the brigade. As for the rest of the crew, well, they've never encountered anything quite like it. The night they came to save a car and rescued a damsel in distress. Their reward, hugs all around. Oh, thank you. It's the dead of night, five minutes to three to be exact. And there's an emergency involving a runaway truck that's demolished a house. First fears are that people in both the truck and the house may have been killed, or at least trapped and injured. It's going to be a very simple job and very nasty job. Any how bad it is, Mark, I'd like to keep the TSV in mind for additional props just to prop up the house. As they arrive, the full extent of the accident is quickly apparent. The prime mover of a semi-trailer has ploughed straight into the front of the house. My brother came running out and had a look. Uh, it's pretty serious, like the water main was busted, all the power lines were down. With the electricity cables severed, there's a danger to the emergency workers themselves. This truck could be live, there's live wires. It looks like it's going into the lounge room. If you look in there, you can see the lounges and the television, so... So it's a lounge room that's been demolished. The wires coming into the house are leaning up against the exhaust pipe of the truck. First task is to bring in a special tool to measure whether the electricity is still flowing. We've tested it with the Mady Walk. It doesn't appear to be live. We're not going to take a chance until Electrical um, Australia get here and cut the power to the wires. And then we'll know we're 100% we're safe. Uh, we believe at this stage that the residents of the house and the truck driver are accounted for. They were so lucky because years ago that used to be their bedroom. Usually the truck driver will come out pretty safe out of these things, but it's usually the the occupants of the house are the ones who had the shock. Inside the house, when the truck hit, were Teresa Samet and her family. We were asleep and we just heard this bang and we got up. And then uh, we see all this crashing stuff into the bedroom. So were you able to get it out of your room all right? Um, just. The front window. What time did you go to bed? About 11. Oh, really? If you'd been in there, where, where would you have been sitting? Right in there. We would have been cleared away, mate. Really? So Teresa and family are alive and unscathed. But the family home has been badly damaged. It was a bit scary, especially to see the front of the truck right in your face first thing in the morning, you know? The truck has done more than demolished the front of the house. It severed the water and all the local telephone lines. There's a lot of glass. Mark and the team now have to assess the condition of the building. We'll have to get all that out. It's sitting on the truck, is it? Yeah. So we're going to make sure that if the truck is pulled out, then this part of the truck isn't affected. The truck's the only thing holding up this wall here. The truck will be pulled back and we've got some props to support the roof. If they pull the truck straight out, the house could collapse. And so in go the props, extended enough to stop the ceiling caving in. Once the demolished room has been secured, those items not damaged are removed. <laughs> that could be a Rembrandt, Eddie. As the house is propped up, thoughts turn to the cause of the accident. I'd say the police will be interviewing the truck driver now, so um, we'll probably find that out a bit later on. Sure. Yeah. Waterboard there, electrical authority uh, here, working. What one hour ago was a roof is carried away, and a large tow truck backed in. Taking up the slack with this, and um. Ah, oh, yes. Stop. The main concern is that we can get some clearance so that we allow a little amount of room for the truck to ride through there without dragging the roof out. We've cleared out any of the bricks behind the front wheels here that will have to ride over. We've given ourselves about a foot and a half clearance above the roof and then we'll bring the truck out. The so the house obviously needs to be rebuilt but in terms of life it was a very lucky escape. What's emerging is why it swerved into Teresa Samet's house. And I came out and the dog's doing donuts on the road. And if I thought, oh, the poor dog's hurt, 
and I looked down here and the water's spurting up. Ah, so the dog's to blame. Police took the dog away to a vet to see if it had a chip and they could determine who owned it. So I think somebody would have woken up with a big surprise in the middle of the night when they realised that their dog had caused an accident. Even when they're off duty, the Blacktown crew are chasing challenges. Whether it's sailing or abseiling, the harder the task, the greater the thrill. I definitely didn't want a job where I was at a desk and just sitting and I wanted something a little bit more active and something where I could be challenged. And, um, where every day I came to work, you didn't know what you were going to be doing. And then that's definitely true. The guys I work with are fantastic. They've accepted me straight away. I've had no feelings that I wasn't welcome. They've been so helpful. Everything, um, I've asked lots of questions and they've always been there to help out. Have you done any climbing, any indoor stuff at all? I was wondering what I'd start you off. It's um, like a little family, I guess. <clears throat> you know, we all work together and we all, you know, work, and we all work together really well. Done a bit of indoor climbing, a bit of abseiling. Yeah, Sandy's fantastic. I haven't been into too many jobs with her just yet, but uh, I can't see a problem with her. She certainly fit in with us quite well, you know. She's enjoying herself, I think, and we're enjoying having her aboard. Kata went across to Glebe, and there was three okay. girls on the shift there, and I was one of the guys. It was interesting. So I, I can imagine how Sandy feels being amongst all the guys here. It feels fine. It's never been an issue. I grew up with five brothers, so I guess it's pretty much the same as when I was growing up. God, there's nowhere to put you on. She doesn't seem to phase her. She wants to give it a go and she's going in there head first to do it, which is great. That's what you need in the job too. You get to trust your footholds. Mm. Okay, now you're going to move around, take a rest there, then bring your left foot onto that ledge. Excellent, Sandy. Walk in the park from there. Things I've got to do that um, take me beyond my comfort zone, I guess. So I'm pushing through my comfort zone all the time. and Yeah, and I'm, and I'm surprised sometimes. I think, wow, well, I did that. Surprise myself. Yeah. <laughs> I think today, once with the climb, she's pushed herself a bit harder than she might normally. She's done something she hasn't tried before, and she really got pressed a bit, got a bit scratchy, and, and came through very well. <sighs> My heart. It's a bit more scary than I thought, and harder than I thought it was going to be. I'm glad I did it now. It's like, I've done it, so it's good. I made it. <laughs> That's about it, guys. Now what we'll do, we'll just take a walk around this very quickly so you know what we're doing, where the boundaries are. Just got to All right. complete the burn of the sector, so we just follow this path along and let it burn up to the end of the burn to so we just light up along the path, follow it all the way along. She's supposed to be putting out fires, not starting them. And yet today, that's exactly what Sandy's doing, igniting bushland as part of a hazard reduction burn. Once the flames have taken hold, the firefighters have to make sure they don't get out of control. What about that one in the tree, Sandy? Hatchie and Sandy have been assigned an area on the eastern side of the burn. Our area of concern is making sure it doesn't, doesn't come past us. And that, that just involves looking at these trees that go above us right. and jump across to there. Yeah. It puts off a lot of heat. It does. Look at the big one. You get a really big one with the crowding fire through these trees. The, yeah. the heat, you feel it from 100 metres or so away. Really? It's really, really hot. See down there? Go down and have a look at that. Yeah, just go down. I'll keep an eye on this corner because we don't want to lose it from here. Today's exercise is bushfire prevention. Firefighters trying to outwit nature yep. and prevent what is becoming an almost annual tragedy. That is so close. Mark has vivid memories of bushfires he's for. Sometimes you make the decision that a house is totally involved, there are others in the street that, that are catching fire and you can't save the one that's totally involved, so you've got to make a, a tough decision and, and abandon it, which is pretty hard to do as a firefighter because you're used to putting fires out and saving houses. 2001, I was working and uh, you know, the house had to be evacuated from up the mountains. I understand where people are coming from when you're defending their houses. Just as it gets closer, you'll feel the, the inrush of air being drawn into the fire and you're standing there realising that more often than not you can't stop it, you're just trying to divert it. main focus is just looking after property, life, uh, the environment comes later. A lady come up and you know, hug me and go, oh, I've lost my house and I, you know, I didn't know what to say. It's that sort of um, thing that we don't see all the time. 
We're normally there, put the fire out, and uh, then we go. Today's exercise is burning through some 20 hectares bordering suburban houses, with the neighbours very conscious of the threat. Uh, about a kilometre away, a lot, a lot of properties were lost, I think, in the 94, 95 fires, and uh, we we're always concerned. What's left after the flames have swept through are dozens of smouldering trees. It's very important to make sure all these smouldering logs and trunks and things are extinguished before we leave the site because they could well smoulder over the night and, and reignite the most. Often they'll jump off to another tree and then they'll yeah. leap across the And another. then there's the wildlife, like this possum. He's able to look after himself. He'll jump to safety, but if there was a bigger fire, he wouldn't have been saved. So, yeah, by him staying up in the treetops, he's fine. Today's burn has been labelled a success. Good training for the real thing and one less area that could ignite when the bushfires sweep through. Mid-afternoon on a balmy Thursday, and the Blacktown crew are about to learn that a very serious fire has broken out. This fire is big, so big that eight stations have been ordered to attend with the team from Blacktown about to drive through several suburbs to get there. They're consummate professionals, turning out in a matter of seconds. Continuing on, number 55, red, red, red. Require three additional pumps to respond to military road in aura to protect the exposure over. Brent, look up military road in aura, please. Getting to this inferno means breaking normal road rules. But they're under lights and sirens, the law giving them the all clear to get there quickly but safely. We have a factory 60 metres by 40 metres, furniture storage, target fire, one exposure, insect to sea is threatened. We are in defensive mode. Have you got that message? Factory total involved. External firefighting, one exposure. More red. Eddie steers this 14 ton truck through the afternoon peak hour traffic like he's on skates. Take the green arrow. While the first firefighters on the scene radio in some disturbing news. This is Pump 55, red, red, red. We have a report of two subcontractors missing in the building. We are currently bringing the owner back to the property to confirm their location. With lives in danger, there's an even greater need to get there quickly. We're in your hands, Brent. We're on the Cumberland Highway now. Should be the first set of lights. New recruit Sandy Warner headlines her first big emergency. I know factory fires can be big, and I heard it's a furniture store, so there's a lot of fuel. So I'm just a bit nervous because I'm thinking that this is going to be a big fire, and because it's my first actual structural fire. And it's going to be so big, I'm just hoping that I don't do anything wrong and, yeah, I'm just going to follow instructions. Sandy's face says it all, nervous apprehension. And as a fire truck turns into the street leading to the fire, the crew are confronted by a chilling sight. The entire factory is totally ablaze. Mark's first task is to get specific instructions. Come to work off the um, hydrant that's in that part of Military Road and hand lines around to here. Yeah, there's a path, there's the fire progress this day, 50% of the building. We're concerned about two um, workers that we haven't seen that were believed to be inside. Right, yeah, so we'll get to work. The immediate assignment is to deploy the crew so in the most effective position. We can go around the sector C, so can you get through there? Yeah. Around the back been reassigned around exposure C. So we're going to go around the back of the building. There's an exposure happening around there. It's big. Yeah. A lot more heat than I thought. So I feel good. I don't feel nervous or anything. I feel. You know, I think my training's really helped. I'm not. I'm, not, I'm nervous about going in or anything like that at all. We do have to wear BA because it's smoke. It's not good today. Sandy and the boys are about to don compressed air tanks and breathing apparatus. The wind's blowing the fire directly towards us, so watch out for flying debris. 
They'll be going right up to the face of the fire, with Sandy to direct and control the main hose. There was a danger of the wall collapsing. We just had to stay back um, enough so that if the wall collapsed, we weren't going to be under it. But also, with two lines of 70, we had to um, try and stop the fire from spreading any further and just keep it under control. Always watching the wall, making sure like any signs of collapse. Any flames that we saw, or any fire, we just tried to keep it out. Also, there was a lot of rubbish in the backyard, so we had to make sure all that was out as well. This is a fairly aggressive fire. It's one of our common problems is the power lines. We can see a sheet of metal's falling onto those power lines, causing some arcing and sparking. This is why we can't let crews into this structure. We're attacking the fire from outside, but at this stage, we've basically lost the building. We're looking at the exposures around, to make sure it doesn't spread any further. First call we got was to a building well alight. In fact, we call a red message. There could have been some people trapped inside. So the first crew done a quick search of the office area. We've responded about 60 firefighters, 10 fire pumps, two ladder trucks, breathing apparatus and hazardous material crews, and an incident management team running the incident. Get that water on the ground, lying in the water. So around the high side of the gate. With no word yet on those two missing workmen, the Blacktown crew are suddenly ordered to back off. Stick a little on where we were standing, the brick wall was in danger of collapsing, so they had to move us out. At this point, the electricity is still connected to the burning building. That'll have to be cut off. What we're going to do is ensure the power's off, look at the structure of the building once we have the fire extinguished. This sort of procedure could take several hours, even days, to determine. The building has clearly been lost. But good news has come through. Those two missing workers, the welders whose sparks started it all, are safe and alive. Relieved by that news is the only firefighter allowed to wear the black helmet, the fire commissioner himself. When there's a major fire, I, I always like to keep my finger on the pulse and make sure the guys and girls are safe. I won't be taking charge of this one. If it was a very major fire that was spreading, I may take charge, but uh, the incident controller has got it well in hand. So I'm going to talk to the troops and hopefully lift morale a bit. Great. How's your new recruit? Very well, sir. We've got Sandy with us. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Are you first fire? Yes. Oh, well, I had a car fire last week. Oh, right, okay. What's, what's the path now? Uh, well, we're waiting to be re reported by the incident commander. Good work. Thanks, sir. Pleasantry's over. It's back to work. What we've been asked to do is take a couple of hand lines into that area there and we're going to start mopping up. Heartbroken by today's tragedy are the victims. I don't think they're going to be in business for a while by looking at it. I've got nothing at all. Unless they have another factory somewhere else. Like well, Anna Khoury, she's lost her lounges. Oh, yeah, so I have no idea if they've got somewhere else. And Tony Yu, his factory lies in ruins. Every day we are working 14 hours. Me and wife, every day. Only 15 minutes, everything gone. Sam Choi's job has gone up in smoke. I was the last one to leave the factory. I went upstairs to put all the documentations outside, through the window, but they were burnt too. All that's left is to mop up and count the cost. $800,000 worth of furniture burnt to cinders. One factory totally destroyed. And the 15 people who worked here heading for the ranks of the unemployed. It's a sight we all dread. Thick plumes of smoke enveloping our city as an out-of-control bushfire races towards our homes. Protecting us are the fireys. Today, 600 of them, mostly rural volunteers, have been called out to help fight an inferno raging on the northern outskirts of Sydney. As police escort residents out of the fire zone, trucks from the New South Wales Fire Brigades are brought in to help save homes, amongst them the Blacktown crew. Which way are the houses we're going to protect today? We've got to go down to Church Point for property protection. If the wind picks up, I guess there's a possibility that we can get some spotting ahead of Mark directs his team through an eerie landscape. The fire has already felled dozens of trees that now litter the road. And down on Coldham Candle Creek, they can only watch as the firestorm races towards them across the water. So what we're seeing here is some helicopters water bombing the fire as it approaches the crest of the ridge here. They're trying to contain the fire lines and make sure that it doesn't spread towards where we're standing. Aiding the firefighters today are the helicopters. Four of them are being used to scoop up massive buckets of seawater and dump it on the encroaching flames. What they were concerned about is ember attack over the top of us, so we're basically deployed here to make sure that uh, if any of the spot fires do start, we get on top of them straight away. When we were first watching, there was some crowning coming over the top of the crest, and now that appears to be controlled, so they're uh, trying to put quite a defined edge on the fire so that there'll be no further spread in this direction. 
Watch how accurate they are. One spot fire has broken out in a timber yard, with the chopper crew able to extinguish it in one well-aimed drop. Part of the Blackdown crew's assignment today is to wash down its rotor blades. They've been covered in ash as they've flown through the heart of the blades. It's also an opportunity to inspect the massive air crane, again used very effectively to save homes. Later, Mark and the team are assigned to protect houses around pit water. The water pressure here is fairly low, but um, we'll get enough for firefighting purposes. So we've just been sent to come down to your street and, and see what sort of danger there is of any kind of spot fires from the fires across the valley. There. Well, last night a nor'easter was blowing right around the, or fire, blowing the fire around that side over there. Yeah until it got sort of round the back of that, uh, that mountain where you can see it burning there now. And while these fires go on to burn up 1,500 hectares of prime bushland in the Karingai National Park, hard work by the firefighters and their choppers means that not one home is lost. For Mark and his team, along with firefighters across Australia, bushfires like these are a heartbreaking challenge. Homes and lives saved because of the risks they're prepared to take. When we tell you to get down low in a fire, it's for a reason. Because the heat from the fire will start at the ceiling. It starts burning from the top of the door, travels down, it's burned it out completely to here. But then you can see further on down just how low the heat gets. And there's about a foot off the floor here that hasn't been damaged by heat, only by smoke. That's why we tell you if you're in a fire, make sure you get as low as you can with your nose on the ground. That's where the cleanest air is, the safest air is, and the coolest air. That's all you've got to try and get out of your house. If you don't do that, you're going to suck in too much smoke and end up collapsing on the floor. And 95% of the time, it's the smoke that kills someone in a house fire or any type of fire. It's not the actual fire itself. Often, if we do come across a fatal in a fire, the person's not burnt. It's just the fact that they've inhaled so much smoke that's killed them.